Hey, we're in the series uh, looking at toxic. And um, the challenge of this series is really to cut to the heart of the matter, to, to deal with those sinful speech habits that creep into our lives, like gossip. And we talked about that last week. And this week we're talking about complaining. And then we're going to look at criticism, exaggeration. But as we look at complaining, uh, the question we want to ask is simply this. When the going gets tough, what do you do? I mean, you and I, we can hear complaints all the time. I mean, like right now, today, it's, it's hot outside. Or in the middle of the winter, it's, it's really cold outside. And, you know, we kind of go back and forth. Or the music in church is too loud. Or the, the music in church is too slow. We hear all these different things. Or the, the preacher at my church preaches too long. Or the preacher at my church doesn't preach long enough. Uh, actually, I don't know that I've ever heard that. Uh, but you hear these complaints all the time. Uh, we live in the culture today of complaining and we can fall into the habit of complaining if we're not careful now there's three reasons why we fall into the habit of complaining um, one is companions the companions the people that we hang out with sometimes we fall in the habit of complaining because the people we're around if we're around negative people people who are grumblers fault finders um, that can be contagious can it um, or we get caught into the comparison game we compare ourselves to other people and we see what they have and we don't have and and we begin to complain about that or we talk about why it's not fair. Um, sometimes the reason we fall into the habit of complaining is because of the crises that come, the crises that happen in our lives. And, you know, when it's tough, when it gets really tough, sometimes we have minor crises in our life, like the computer locks up or we get a flat tire or something breaks at home or the kids are sick or you know something like that happens it's, it's more of a minor crisis but sometimes it gets really tough you know a person has a, a miscarriage or you lose your job or the doctor comes and and says the report's not good it's you know it's it's cancer and those are tough setbacks sometimes in life you know we live in we live in a fallen world tornadoes happen car wrecks cancer so so listen when life gets tough and life really happens and it happens to you and you find yourself sitting on the curb shaking your head or even shaking your fist at god saying god why me why me why now in acts chapter 16 paul and silas are in the city of philippi paul has been preaching and worshiping there with the church, the believers, and a slave girl has been following them around. And this slave girl, the Bible says, was, was demon-possessed. So finally, Paul has had enough of her interruptions and the things that were going on. So in Acts chapter 16, verse 18, it says, this went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and he said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. Now, when they were taken to the authorities, the authorities ordered that Paul and Silas be flogged. Now, when they were flogged, that meant that their backs would have been literally torn apart. And then they're dragged, um, you know, beaten and torn uh, to prison. So Paul and Silas are now in a prison cell. So what does Paul do? He has every reason in the world to complain about what has just happened. He, he did a, really what we would consider a great thing in the name of Jesus. And in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, and I love how the message says this. The message says, along about midnight, Paul and Silas were at prayer and singing a robust hymn to God. The other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. They're praising God in the middle of prison. I mean, they're beaten up, they're torn, they're in prison, it's, it's midnight. And what in the world would make a man sing in prison? I'll tell you what I think would cause a man to, to sing and, and to praise God in the midst of this pain and agony imprisonment. I think it was joy. Paul was a man who was marked by joy. Instead of falling into the habit of complaining, Paul had learned to count it all joy, he says. Joy, joy is what helps you to persevere through those difficult times. 
Complaining is draining. Complaining will rob you of your strength. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, Nehemiah continued. He said, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't, don't be dejected and sad for the joy of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is what will help you persevere through those hard times. Joy is a powerful witness to the world. So if you're truly going to be a faithful follower of Jesus, a follower of the Lord, then you got to let him have your life. As we said last week, you got to let him have your heart. And when you allow him to have your life and to have your heart, you will be a person marked by joy as well. That's how we rid ourselves of complaining. We, we have to have a heart of joy. So how in the world do we find the ability to have the heart of joy? Because I'm telling you, when life gets tough, a man, life can get tough and life can hurt. A lot of times I'm joy impaired. How about you? Where did, where did Paul find his joy? What was the source of his joy? How, how can you and I have that same heart of joy in our lives? Well, first of all, the, the first thing that I see that Paul kind of speaks about is the fact that he has the joy of creation. He, he didn't ignore what God had given to us, the beautiful world that surrounds us. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4, since everything created is good, we should not reject any of it, but receive it with thanks. He says, we're to receive this beautiful world that God has given to us, that God has made with thanksgiving in our hearts, joy. He goes on to say in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud, not to put their trust in their, their money, which is so unreliable, but put their trust. Their trust should be in, in God, who richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment. This beautiful world that God has created, God has given to us as a gift. It's a gift from God. He wants us to have fun with this world and enjoy it. The, the second joy that, that Paul speaks to, to, to have a heart of joy, is the joy of salvation. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul is giving us his personal testimony. And he says in verses 16 through 17, he says, God, but God had mercy on me so that Jesus Christ could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst of sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. All honor and glory to God forever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who, who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. I mean, Paul is praising the Lord. He is joyous because of what God has done in his life. Jesus has saved him, changed him. He is not the same person. When is the last time that you were so overwhelmed that God would love you, that God would love me? us sinners. Psalms 51 verse 12 says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. That needs to be the message on our heart. Lord, you know, continue to restore to me, remind me of the joy of your salvation, that I am lost. I am nothing without you. That's the joy factor. Maybe that's the prayer that you need to pray today. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. But another thing that I think that Paul speaks to when it comes to joy is the joy factor is the joy of anticipation. Paul saying because of the joy of looking forward to going to heaven, he knew this world was not his home because you see creation is good. No doubt about it, but this is a fallen world. This creation, this world has things like cancer and tornadoes and mosquitoes and flies. And it reminds us that this world is, is imperfect. Paul was looking forward to that day when everything would be made new, a brand new heaven, a brand new earth, a perfect creation, just the way God intended for it to be. The joy of salvation, that's great. We are saved by the blood of Jesus, but even salvation is, is, is incomplete. It feels like a long distance relationship. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12, he says, now, now we see these things imperfectly as in a cloudy mirror. 
but then we'll see everything perfect with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then he says, I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Paul was looking forward to that day when he would be there face to face with Jesus. In Romans chapter 12, verse 12, Paul says, rejoice in our confident hope be patient in trouble, keep on praying. That's why we see Paul in prison, beaten and torn, singing. That's why Paul sang. This is why Paul was singing in the midst of a prison. True joy is a singing confidence, a singing hope in heaven. The reason that we can have joy is, is not because we're saying, well, it could be worse, you know, because it, it can always be worse. The reason that we have true joy in our hearts is someday, we know someday it will be better. And God promises he is gonna make everything brand new. That's why we sing, that is why we rejoice. This is why at the very end of his life, Paul, you know, when he was in prison, just days, just days from execution, he is writing this letter, 2 Timothy. And in the end of this letter, he has his very last words. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18, he says, Yes, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Paul goes out singing. You see, when the, the going gets tough, when you get tired, when you're weary, when you are worn out, you are tempted to sit on the curb, shake your head and complain. Have you done that? I have. May I encourage you today. May we encourage each other to stand up and to look ahead and have joy in our hearts. And we look at the end of day and we sing. Because our hope is not in us. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in others. Our hope is in Christ and in Christ alone. So I want to encourage you this week. If you haven't listened to the podcast of Sunday's message, as we talked in great detail about complaining, you can listen to the podcast. Uh, I would encourage you to take your message connect notes and uh, also your questions here and, and use this in your personal devotion time, your personal study. Uh, maybe talk about this around the dinner table. How can we be better followers of Jesus? Or if you want to get a group of folks together, some friends, co-workers, you know, folks at church, a small group, and you want to talk through this and dig a little deeper. You see, this is what all this is about. Allowing the Lord to go deeper in our hearts and deeper into our relationships, that we encourage one another, challenge one another, pray for one another, love one another, that we can truly be faithful followers of Jesus. Until next time, let's keep our chins up have our joy in Christ.